midday is Cindy Osborne and Bill Carlson. Outside, playing. Or inside, planting. Midday, talking with the stars of today. And sharing history with the stars of yesterday. Treat yourself to a lunchtime luxury. Midday, Monday through Friday at noon on WCCO-TV, Channel 4. Jogging can be good for you. Ooh, unless he has a soft tissue injury. And but I there can be life. problems, including painful injuries. So we're going to put a little bit of ice on it. Okay. Jogging injuries can be prevented. Oh, that's all right. See your yeah, physical we'll therapist. Up. And for free information on how to plan your jogging program, write the American Physical Therapy Association. Television, Minneapolis, St. Paul. From WCCO Television, the Northwest's leading news station, this is the 10 p.m. report. Good evening. Don Shelby's on vacation. I'm Ann Rubenstein filling in for him. In the news tonight, the U.S. Olympic Committee has decided to support the idea of an Olympic boycott. And the soaring silver prices are making several hobbies much more expensive. And the hockey gophers are meeting the Wolverines of Michigan. We'll have the highlights later in sports. But our top story tonight, a New York City veteran cop has been picked to be the next chief of the Minneapolis Police Department. Mayor Don Fraser chose Anthony Boza, who says there will be no politics in his police department. Tom Hendrick covered that story today. Boza from New York City is a police veteran with 27 years experience. He is also a college professor. Mayor Frazier says he expects Boza to do such a good job there will be no need for political meddling in the police department. Boza said depoliticizing the department was his biggest concern and was asked about his priorities for improving the department. My first priority is really to learn about it and that's, that's the simple truth. Uh, I think I have to find out uh, what the department looks like and how it breathes and feels. I don't envision any dramatic or drastic uh, immediate changes, assuming that the confirmation goes through and, the, and then the council acts as we hope uh, that it will act. Bose's nomination must be confirmed by the city council. Hearings begin next week. If confirmed, he expects to come to Minneapolis to stay in about two weeks. Tom Hendrick, WCCO Television News, Minneapolis. Iran has a new president tonight and one who is a moderate on the issue of releasing the American hostages. The president is Bani Saad, a 46-year-old who is close to the Ayatollah Khomeini. Bani Saad is leading the presidential field by a 5-to-1 margin, and he says his first priority is to resolve the hostage crisis, which he calls a minor incident that has taken too much time and attention. Today, he said, I will try to bring this problem between the United States and ourselves to an end in a way in which safeguards the demands and independence of Iran. Bani Saad is the first elected president in Iran in the past 37 years. And in that same part of the world, there will be an Islamic minister's conference in Pakistan tomorrow. Libya says it's going to join that meeting to condemn the Russian invasion of Afghanistan. Now, Libya's entrance to the meeting is particularly significant since it has traditionally been a pro-Russian country. In the meantime, there are reports that the Soviets are upset with Afghan President Babra Karmal, the man they put into power. Reports reaching, reaching Washington say Karmal may soon be replaced. And Afghan rebels today began shooting at Soviet troops in the capital city of Kabul. Two rifle shots rang out in the frigid air aimed at a jeep load of Soviet soldiers. One Russian reported was killed in the attack. The others jumped for cover and then launched a search for the snipers. It was the first time Western reporters have seen an attack on the Soviets in Kabul. Mike? Tonight, the U.S. Olympic Committee has put its unanimous voice behind the president, giving endorsement to Mr. Carter's request to move, to postpone, or to cancel the Moscow Summer Games. More on this late story now from CBS's Gary Shepard. The executive board of the U.S. Olympic Committee met here all day long, then revealed it had reached a unanimous decision on President Carter's request. Committee President Robert Kane made the announcement. The United States Olympic Committee directs its officers and staff to propose to the International Olympic Committee that the 1980 Summer Olympic Games be transferred to another site or multiple sites or be postponed or canceled for this year.
Kane said his organization does not like the idea of a formal boycott of the Moscow Games. He admitted today's action is an attempt to buy time, and the next move, he said, is up to the International Olympic Committee. That we have until May 24 to decide whether we'll enter a team. And uh, that is not uh, the same as a boycott. A boycott has a, an unfriendly uh, sort of hostile uh, connotation to it that uh, we don't accept at all. American athletes will continue to train for the 1980 Summer Games, but Kane said it is his impression, based on today's discussion, that if the International Olympic Committee refuses to move the games out of Moscow, the United States will not enter a team this year. Gary Shepard, CBS News, Colorado Springs. In addition, Canada has thrown its support behind the Carter boycott request. Today, Prime Minister Joe Clark asked Canadian athletes to avoid to boycott the Summer Games if the Soviets have not withdrawn from Afghanistan by February the 20th. And today, President Carter's major Democratic opponent, Ted Kennedy, got an earful of foreign policy. Kennedy got an hour-long briefing on all aspects of the international situation from the State Department today. He plans on making a speech Monday on world affairs. And, Anne, he's expected to firmly criticize the president when he makes that speech. Mike, Ted Kennedy is the favorite of many blacks for the presidential nomination. That's according to Georgia's Julian Bond. Bond cites the reason is the president's treatment of domestic issues. While there's a general national concern for what's ha happening in Afghanistan and Iran, at the same time there's a concern in the American black community for domestic concerns that may be greater than in the general population. That's most blacks are Democrats. And we see Governor Brown and we say, well, uh, we're unclear about him. And we see Senator Kennedy and we say, here's a man who's got an 18-year record of being in favor of the things we want town to help campaign for Bill Wilson, who's running for St. Paul City Council. Bond is a state senator in Carter's home state of Georgia. Independent Republicans in our state got together today to elect a new chairwoman of the party, and they took action to heighten interest in the Republican precinct caucuses that are a month away. Karen Boros has that story. While New Hampshire is overrun with candidates and news media, Minnesota remains untrampled. Yesterday there was Bush. The the Last night Reagan. Tribune wasn't happy today Stassen. Thank you. And Baker's daughter, Sissy. That was it. But the absence of candidates didn't stop Republicans from talking presidential politics. Senator Durenberger said, stand behind Carter during a crisis, but not forever. But meanwhile, those of us, whether it's the loyal opposition or the opposition within his own party, have a responsibility to change his approach and failing that, to change him. So there is no doubt in my mind whatsoever that Jimmy Carter is not going to be President of the United States in January of 1981. <laughs> Most of the politicking here was devoted to electing a new state chairwoman, with Pat Pariseau of Farmington running against Dorothy Lilligren of Plymouth. Lilligren had the endorsement of Cui and Wanberg and Durenberger, and she won, but by less of a margin than expected, some delegates apparently resenting the endorsements. Pat Pariseau was a very good candidate. And um, she ran a very good campaign. And I think her speech was very, very good and pointed out the reasons why those delegates should be independent and vote as they saw fit and not follow the lead of the governor. Independent Republicans also decided to spend $12,000 on a caucus night straw ballot, similar to the one in Iowa. Without that, it would be several days before caucus results were known. It is their hope that the straw ballot will attract more Republicans on caucus night, bring more candidates into the state, and get more national news media attention, perhaps robbing some of the thunder from the New Hampshire primary. Karen Boris, WCCO Television News. And the Republican results in our state next month could make the race between Ronald Reagan and George Bush even hotter than it is now. Here's Richard Roth. When the paths of the two candidates crossed in Minnesota this week, Bush predicted the majority of delegates would be his. He did? <laughs> he did. Well, of course, if he has some special claim on them, I'll take what's left, but uh, I, I don't know. I'm, uh, I'm, I expect to come in and try to... Um, and get as many as possible out of here. Minnesota's GOP chairman points to the psychological importance of the caucuses. A loss in New Hampshire might be balanced by a win here, a notion that appeals to Bush. I, I will be obviously doing what anybody would do, is if you don't do well in one place and do well in another, you try to get the focus over the other way. 
The focus may not be here a month from now, but that won't diminish the significance of the Minnesota vote. In a hotly contested nomination fight where appearances can mean almost as much as facts, Minnesota voters could ruin the fortunes of an also-ran or make a front-runner seem invincible. Richard Roth, CBS News, St. Paul. What a conference! What a conference! What conference, sir? Managers from three states just bought my proposal. But there's no one in there, sir. I know. I dialed the operator and brought everyone together on a long-distance conference call. We did the job in minutes instead of days. Why, that's wonderful, sir! No, Miss Kern, that is genius. A long-distance conference call. It's a way to get things done today. Professional wrestling attracts nearly 30 million paying customers a year in this country. It's a sport that has captured the loyalty of middle America. Here in the Twin Cities, it's been a thriving enterprise for years behind the efforts of Vern Gagne. This is Mark Rosen. Watch for Wrestling with Success, a series of special reports beginning Monday, January 28th on the 10 p.m. report here on Channel 4. You do like to see the kids change, but it's unrealistic to think that they're going to change just because of you. They're going to change maybe their whole situation uh, later in life, and you aren't going to see the rewards except these little things. But they're there. They're do there. you have to really believe? Foster homes are desperately needed now. Do you have what it takes to take in a kid? Call 348-KIDS and find out. Just before news time, we learned that an earthquake shook part of Northern California today, causing buildings to sway and rattling windows. There were no reports yet of any injuries or damage. But just two days ago, a quake measuring 5.5 on the Richter scale hit another part of Northern California. Mike? The Boundary Waters Canoe Area in Northern Minnesota is due for a lot of money this year from the federal government. President Carter, in fact, will ask for $13.8 million for the BWCA in the next fiscal year. That according to Congressman James Oberstar of Minnesota. The nearly $14 million in aid for the BWCA would be four times the money spent last year. However, not much of that new money will go to help resort owners and canoe outfitters who claim they are hurting bad since that area became a national wilderness. Minnesota is trying to improve its nuclear emergency plan. Governor Al Qui, in fact, has come up with a $300,000 proposal, but even that might fall short of the federal government standard. Now, the government wants not only sophisticated radiation detection equipment or an upgraded communication system, it also is pushing for a more extensive warning plan that would alert people within 10 miles of a nuclear accident. Now, that plan alone could cost as much as $200,000. Minnesota state officials meeting next week to talk about that plan. The state of Minnesota also is going to court next week to gain permission to inspect this grain elevator in southeast Minneapolis. The Archer Daniels Midland elevator recently refused to allow an inspector inside. The state is investigating complaints about excessive grain dust in this elevator. And there's a charge the elevator did not report two recent fires. And the state wants to check that out. Tonight, the FBI is asking for information about Minnesota's seventh bank robbery of 1980. A man robbed the Faribault National Bank just before noon today, taking an undisclosed sum of money. He is described as a white male, 5 feet 8 inches tall, and in his late 20s. And the FBI is trying to keep a lid on how a hijacker smuggled a pistol through the Atlanta airport security system yesterday. But an airport official today says the man apparently tucked the gun into a baby seat-type carrier, and the airport cops just didn't catch it. The hijacker boarded the flight with his wife and children. He said he wanted to take the wide-body jet Delta to Iran, but only made it as far as Havana, where he was overpowered during refueling. The lights and the music might go out pretty soon now for the Minnesota Dance Theater. All 20 dancers of that troupe have been laid off because the company has accumulated a debt of $61,000. Now, that layoff is scheduled for March through September, and the company will use that time for a major fund drive. Trash, that's right, garbage, is paying for some scholarships at the Woomer Community College in Minnesota. Empty pop cans are being collected and sold for recycling, and that money uh, brought in will be given to students who have done janitorial work for the school. This uh, pop scholarship idea came from the maintenance department there, and it hopes to raise $300 by next spring. It takes in 20 to 30 cans, pounds of those cans, to make one pound of aluminum, and the going rate for that one pound is a... Well, Mike, aluminum and...
be compared in price, but the variety in which they are used is comparable. And because silver has become so expensive, so have those products in which it is used. Barb Brown has more. This box of coins is worth $160 at face value, but it just sold for $2,400, one effect of skyrocketing silver prices. Those prices may be a boon to coin collectors, but if your hobby is music, be forewarned. A flute which sold for $1,000 last year now sports a $1,600 price tag, and the cost of silver-plated instruments is also on a crescendo. If your hobby is photography, be prepared for a 50% film price increase. Well, when they first announced the increase, the publicity received through the newspapers, Wall Street Journal, did cause an immediate rush and the hoarding policy by many people. But I think basically, if a store was uh, ideally trying to take care of its customer, it did limit their supplies and wouldn't allow any uh, surplus purchases. And after you shoot your film, you'll have to pay more for the processing. The uh, amateur photographer will be paying more for his uh, films uh, and more for his photo finishing eventually because the photo finishers are going to pay more for their photographic paper. One visual industry which hasn't felt the silver squeezes badly is television news. Most of our work is no longer done on film, but on videotape. Barb Brown, WCCO Television News. Anybody here married in the 50s? Uh, Donahue audiences are full of surprises. Did you know what you were doing? Hell no. <laughs> Suppose we're married. I'd love it. <laughs> you never know what to expect on Donahue. Donahue, weekday mornings at 8, here on Channel 4. Now that public schools are teaching more children with handicaps, the children without handicaps are getting some special education, too. In this school, the children try out disability kits. They learn something about blindness, something about orthopedic handicaps, and something about themselves. If you'd like to know more about programs like this, write us. Closer Look, Box 1492, Washington, D.C., 20013. The low snowfall in Minnesota this winter has taken a toll on a company that makes snowmobiles. The Scorpion plant in Crosby, Minnesota, is closing down for a while. Most workers have been laid off there. Scorpion says the one-two punch of a weak economy and a mild winter has ruined sales. In Boulder, Colorado, Red Cross officials had scheduled a workshop in winter storm preparedness for today. But they had to turn it into the real thing. A blizzard with 67 mile an hour winds hit the eastern slopes of Colorado and other parts of the plains causing at least one death and tons of traffic problems. And Bill, I can't begin to imagine what it would feel like right here with 67 mile an hour winds. Yes, Freezing. I, that would be difficult. You know, I, I met a group of Norwegians, a whole plane load of Norwegians arrived today to participate in several winter events, and they weren't on the ground for more than 30 minutes and they were already cross-country skiing and doing it. But they had brought skis with wheels just in case we hadn't gotten any snow, but they had a warning of uh, how little snow we've had this year, too. But we do have enough for cross-country skiing now and for several winter events, and uh, certainly we do have a wintry feeling in the air. Exactly. Our temperature <laughs> dropping all evening, 6 below zero right now, minus 21 Celsius, winds northwesterly at 10 miles per hour, produces a wind chill of minus 29. Humidity now 84%, the barometer 30.31, barometric pressure is rising slowly. Here are the stats for the day. The coldest was uh, 14 below zero early this morning. Got up to one below zero. That was the highest for today. Sunrise tomorrow at 739. Here are the way things look right now in Minnesota and Wisconsin. The Arrowhead region does have snow right now. Duluth, four below zero, five below at International Falls, and snow falling at both of those reporting stations. 13 below zero under cloudy sky at Bemidji. The southern portion of the state, uh, mostly fair to partly cloudy. You'll see that picture on the satellite just a moment. 10 below zero now at Eau Claire, 5 below at La Crosse, and 4 degrees above zero for the hot spot on this map at least. That is at Milwaukee. The weather net, <coughs> excuse me, weather net reporting stations for today. The low this morning at Rice Lake, 19 degrees below zero, 14 at Duran, 14 also at Sandstone, minus eight at St. Peter. The highs for the day look like lows under in most situations because it didn't get beyond, uh, above uh, five below zero at Rice Lake, two below at Annandale, two below also at Duran. 
Now let's take a look at the national picture. As you can see, those very, very cold temperatures fell all the way down into Colorado and uh, well down into the, the northern portion of uh, Iowa in our particular vicinity. And uh, there were warm temperatures only in the extreme southern portion of uh, Florida and in the extreme southern tip of Texas and then also in the southern portion of California. But most of the nation had a rather chilly day today. Let's take a look at WCCO Weather Watch color radar. As you can see, there's no precipitation within our 120 nautical, nautical mile range. Actually, if we expanded it, you probably wouldn't see any uh, considerably beyond that. The satellite picture shows uh, we did have some area of heavy cloud cover and some precipitation last night at about this time. Then most of that moved in a northeasterly direction. But at the last check, we did have some precipitation, as uh, we indicated to you just a moment ago. In the northern portion of Minnesota, here's the latest picture, the northern portion of Minnesota, especially in the Arrowhead region, and a little bit moving into the southeast, uh, southwestern corner of, the, of uh, Minnesota as well. Southeastern corner of the United States has precipitation, and that appears on our map in this regard, 53 degrees for Atlanta tomorrow. Uh, they will have rain, 79 degrees in Miami. They probably will have rain, too. There may be some snow flurries in the uh, Great Lakes region, probably no heavy accumulation, uh, one to one and a half, maybe two inches in some areas, especially in the southern portion of Lake Erie. Now, on the western half of the United States, snowfall will... Uh, extend from the uh, eastern side of the Rocky Mountain Range into the Great Plains region. Uh, it will, for the most part, go to the south of our five-state area. We'll have fair to partly cloudy skies here. That will also be true of the Pacific Northwest. 30 degrees expected to be the high tomorrow in Seattle, five below zero in Billings. Here's the forecast for our metropolitan area. Partly cloudy overnight, cold temperatures continuing. Now, the most recent revision from 15 to 20 degrees below zero overnight. The high for tomorrow probably won't get much above zero. And then the extended forecast calls for temperatures considerably below normal for this time of year, well into the week. Probably we'll have snow flurries on Monday. Probably run into snow flurries once again about midweek, uh, Wednesday or Thursday. And the highs during this week, 10 to 15 degrees above zero. Well, you know, everybody's talking. This is my first winter in the mm -hmm. Twin Cities and how lucky I've been and how mild it's been. I, I want to be luckier. You're just going to get a <laughs> taste of it. <laughs> I want to keep on being lucky. Thank you, Bill. In other news tonight, Abbott Hospital at 18th Street and 1st Avenue in Minneapolis closed its doors today in the final step of a merger with Northwestern Hospital that began in 1970. The hospital's final 32 patients were moved early this morning by scores of specially trained medical personnel. A fleet of ambulances called in from other hospitals transported the patients to a new health care facility at Abbott Northwestern Hospital. That's at 27th and Chicago. Each step of the patient's trip was closely monitored by the medical personnel and police who provided traffic control along the mile-long route to the new health care facility. Hospital moves are rare. Abbott is only uh, the third Twin Cities hospital to move within the past 20 years. They're calling it Art on Wheels, the wheels of a Metropolitan Transit bus, that is. The bus has been decked out by 25 artists from Dayton's. They call it the Picasso Mobile, and they've sent it on its way to promote the upcoming Picasso exhibit at the Walker Art Center. And you can view this bus on MTC's I-94 route starting on Monday. If you haven't been to the dentist lately, look at it from your mouth's point of view. You're right. No cavities. Uh, you have pyorrhea. Uh -huh. Gum disease. Most people don't even know they have it. Uh -huh. For your comfort. Dentistry has changed since you went last. Uh -huh. They will be, but it's up to you to keep them that way. See your dentist and keep your teeth before gum disease has you looking for a place to keep them. This is Mark Rosen inviting you to be with us Sunday morning at 11.30 for Inside Basketball with Jim Dutcher. The Gophers continue their Big Ten Wars this week with games against Indiana and their controversial coach Bobby Knight and with Iowa University. We'll have complete highlights from both games plus interviews with the key players. We'll also check the scores and have highlights from other Big Ten games plus reports on the high school basketball scene in the state. So be with us Sunday morning at 11.30 for Inside Basketball right here on Channel 4. Sunday night at 11 o'clock on Channel 4, William Holden stars as Bumper Morgan, Bumper. the Blue Knight. I want a boy. An aging Los Angeles policeman tries to choose between his career on the force and marriage with the woman he loves, Lee Remick, on the 11 o'clock Sunday movie on 4. The decision is not yes, an easy yeah. one. 
I hadn't thought about having a family. Every evening, Channel 4 plays favorites. Tulsa beat the kicks 3-1 to one tonight before about 10,000 fans in the Sports Center. And that loss dropped the kicks a full game behind the division-leading Memphis in the North American Soccer League Western Division. Tulsa opened the scoring tonight on a play in the first period. Tino Letteri makes the initial stop, but Don Huber was waiting for the rebound, and the Roughnecks led 1-0. Tulsa doubled that lead a short time later. Once again, it was Huber, a 20-year-old forward, who got the goal. And the Roughnecks put the game away before the half on Billy Gonzona's shot just caught the far corner of the Minnesota net. Tony Watt got the only goal for the North for the uh, kicks, and that final was Tulsa 3 and the kicks 1. The Gopher hockey team avenged last night's defeat by beating Michigan 6-2 tonight in Williams Arena. Minnesota actually won the game on a play with just six seconds to go in the second period. Bob Bergloff let a slap shot fly from the blue line, and the shot is stopped, but Mike Kanoki is at the doorstep, ready for the rebound, and the Gophers had a 3-2 lead. Minnesota exploded for three more goals in the final period to make the final of the Gophers 6 and Michigan 2. The North Stars rally with a pair of third period goals to tie the Los Angeles Kings 4-4 in the Sports Center this afternoon. Now the Kings managed only four shots in the first period, but three of them went in. LA extended its lead to 4-2 with a goal in the second period, Butch Goring second of the game. The Stars, who outshot the Kings 47-18, roared back in the final six minutes. Gary Sargent cut LA's lead to 4-3. And then with 47 seconds to go, Glenn Sharpley Pass to Mike Eaves, who returned the favor and sharply blasted home the equalizer, bringing the crowd of nearly 15,000 to its feet. The Stars return to the road tomorrow night in Chicago, where they play the Blackhawks. Also in the National Hockey League this afternoon, Quebec and Washington play to a one-all tie. Atlanta 4-3 tonight over Detroit. Boston over Pittsburgh 6-4, and the Islanders beat Hartford 3-2. John Ziegler, the president of the National Hockey League, has suspended three Boston Bruins and fined the entire team, except for the goalie, for their part in a brawl with the New York fans last month after a game with the Rangers, a shoe of one of the fans being used as a weapon. This afternoon at Iowa, the Gopher basketball team lost to the Hawkeyes 80-73, and that loss dropped the Gophers to 5-3 in the Big Ten, and yet they are only a game back of first place Ohio State because the Buckeyes lost tonight. After trailing by nine at the half, Kevin McHale put the Gophers ahead 63-62 with five minutes to go. The Hawkeyes were up 68-65 when McHale dropped one. Kevin led the Gophers with 23 points. The man who hurt the Gophers most was Kenny Arnold. The sophomore backcourt ace got 27 points and made 11 of 14, including one in which McHale was whistled in a questionable goaltending call. Thursday, the Gophers will play the Wildcats at Northwestern. Complete highlights of the Iowa Gopher game can be seen tomorrow morning here on Inside Basketball with Mark Rosen and Jim Dutcher beginning at 11.30 right here on Channel 4. Northwestern, meanwhile, beat Michigan 85-82 in three overtimes in Evanston, Illinois. Northwestern's Jim Stack tied the game at 64 at the end of regulation play. And it was tied at 68 after the first overtime and at 72 after the second one. Michigan's Johnny Johnson made it 83-80 in the third overtime, but two free throws by Northwestern gave them that 85-82 win. And seventh-rated Notre Dame beat Maryland 64-63 before a sellout crowd of over 11,000 in South Bend, Indiana. With 22 seconds to go, Maryland put the ball in play, and Albert King made it 62-61 Notre Dame. 16 seconds to go, Albert steals a mishandled inbounds pass, and Maryland leads 63-62. 12 seconds to go, Tracy Jackson dribbles the length of the floor, and he scores with four seconds to go to give the Aries that 64-63 win. Also, in addition, Indiana beat Purdue 69-58 Illinois over Michigan State. And would you believe that Wisconsin one-point win over Ohio State? And that was in Columbus. Virginia over North Carolina State. North Carolina beat Clemson. Syracuse over Connecticut. Marquette over South Carolina. Washington State over UCLA. LSU defeated Florida. Kentucky over Georgia. Carleton over Co. Golden Valley Lutheran defeated North Hennepin. Alabama beat Tennessee, Duke over Pittsburgh, St. John's over Villanova, and number one, DePaul, the only major unbeaten team in the country, 105 to 94 over Evansville. All right, thank you, Hal. One other uh, sports-type story today that edges into the realm of news, 
Tonight, the Minnesota Kicks uh, joined various local celebrities in running around the Met Sports Center soccer field trying to uh, kick up some aid money for Cambodian refugees. WCCO's Pat Miles joined the action, as did Mayor uh, Don Fraser, Senator Nick Coleman, KSTP's Ron Majors, WTCN's Nancy Nelson, and others. Here's Pat Miles doing some cheerleading and a little bit of kicking <laughs> along the way. Now the money part of this story, uh, it seems that a percentage uh, of tonight's kicks ticket sales will be donated to the American Refugee Committee. And that concludes our news for this night, January 26th, the 84th day of captivity for the American hostages in Iran. And please join us again tomorrow at 5.30 and at 10 o'clock. Good night, everyone. Good night. Welcome to Wix Furniture's Million Dollar Sale. Our warehouse is so overloaded that we cut prices on hundreds of items in every department. Now through Monday night, you'll find terrific bargains on selected bedrooms, family rooms, living rooms. Dining rooms, dinettes, recliners, even bedding. And they're all backed by the Wix promise of satisfaction. Our Million Dollar Sale ends Monday night. That's Wix Furniture for you. Quality home furnishings at prices you can afford. to the changes America we're doing what we knew we could looking to the 80s looking for excitement looking to the 80s CBS we're looking good we're looking good here looking good there looking good everywhere looking to the 80s CBS we're looking good well I've heard all the talk about adult education you're never too old to learn but I said have you ever heard of being too tired? After I drive a cab all day long, I don't feel like driving to college at night. That's when I heard about college by television. Now look at me. I've got a little class in my living room. For information on University of Minnesota Television Independent Study Courses, call 612-376-4925 during business. WCCO Television, Minneapolis, St. Paul. in the program taken by NASA. They prove some theories that astronomers have been thinking about for years and they add some questions to the list of questions astronomers have about our universe. Astronomer Dr. Nancy Morrison will be with us. She recently visited St. Catherine's College. She is from the University of Toledo. She has some magnificent photographs to show you in just a few moments. A little bit later in the show we're going to be talking to film producer Jeff Convitz. Uh, he wrote a book called The Sentinel a couple of years ago, was very successful at that, made a motion picture which he says is slightly less successful, but he's got a movie coming out now called Gorp that has a lot of people gagging and some people cheering, and it remains to be seen how successful it is, but Jeff Convitz will talk to us about the business of producing motion pictures in just a few moments. Cliff Gorman, a gentleman who has done very, very well for himself on Broadway. He played Lenny in the show of the same name. If you saw the film Lenny, that was Cliff Gorman as well. He played in both the Broadway version and the film version of Boys in the Band. Rather unusual accomplishment. Uh, he most recently was seen in Neil Simon's Chapter 2 on Broadway, but now he's kind of emphasizing the film portion of his career. And he stars in a picture with James Brolin, this picture called Night of the Juggler. Cliff plays a, a mentally deranged man who uh, feels that the wealthy have always been against him and he holds them responsible for failure in his life. To get even, he is going to kidnap the daughter of a wealthy person. Not knowing that he has kidnapped the daughter of a former policeman and now a truck driver, played by James Brolin, he still thinks the young lady is the daughter of a millionaire. And toward the end of the picture, this confrontation takes place between Jim Rowland and Cliff Gorman. Monty, get up! She wants to 
to be with me. You got the money. I want the money for her. We're gonna have fine things again, like it used to be. It's gonna be perfect. We're gonna have everything we want. Everything's gonna be just right. Now get out of here and leave us alone. Get out of here. Don't be afraid. Get out of here. We won't hurt you. Just go on. <laughs>